Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Carrillo. Today we have Bo Beery. Bo has been in the commercial real estate business since 1999. He has consistently ranked as the number one multifamily producer in Florida for the Coldwell Banker commercial brand and among the top five in the nation every year before starting his own private multifamily brokerage firm in 2021. And he just wrote a book called Multifamily Investors Who Dominate. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Bo. Yeah, man, this is awesome. Been looking forward to this for weeks. So how have you, uh, you've been involved with, uh, with commercial real estate for 20 plus years. What was your professional background prior to joining Coldwell in 2011? Sure. So I, I graduated from the University of Florida um, with a master's in real estate. And, you know, a lot of my colleagues were going off and getting these cool jobs at eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year at 20 something years old. And um, I had met my wife in the program and she wanted to stay in Gainesville, right? So I knew that my, my options were a little bit more limited than being able to go all over the country. So I, I got a job with the AMJ group, which actually happened to be the, the number one development and investment firm. They were based in Gainesville, but they bought all over. They bought and developed all over the primarily the Southeast. Um, they now acquire stuff all over the country. But I was with them for 10 years out of college. And what I did was I brokered and managed a pretty diverse portfolio of office, retail, industrial, and apartments. Um, and uh, the second half of my time there, so the last five years, I did a lot of the acquisitions with the main principal. And the great thing was I was able to master sort of the buyer and the seller side of the transaction. And more importantly, I learned, you know, what brokers do to be most valuable to a transaction which is basically to provide like a perspective and, and help each party learn empathy, you know, sort of see the other side's constraints and, and be able to come together. So it was really good to learn from the, the principal side of things. Interesting. That's awesome. <laughs> so what markets and size properties does your firm cover now? So I cover the, the, the northern half of Florida. Uh, so that's, that's Orlando, Winter Haven, uh, Lakeland, uh, Ocala, Gainesville, all of Volusia County on the mm -hmm. East Coast. So Daytona, Deland, New Smyrna, Ormond, up to St. Augustine, up to Jacksonville, all the way over to Tallahassee, Lake City in the middle, and any of those other little podunk towns in the middle. I do mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, and mostly it's everything that's, I do anything over 10 units, right? And, and most of my deals though are between 50 and 200 units. That's kind of where I play ball most of the time. I'll do a lot of 20 and 30 unit listings and I'll do a lot of 100, 150 unit listings, uh, but most of it's between 50 and 200. Okay, cool. So number one thing I hear from investors is how difficult it is to find deals at Pencil. For investors you work <laughs> with, how are you advising them to find deals in such a competitive marketplace? <laughs> I get asked this <laughs> a lot about, you know, how to find deals in this market. And, you know, frankly, it's almost, it's almost the wrong question. What, what, what we should be asking is, how do deals find me, right? So the greatest investors that, that, I, that I've worked with in the past, they don't, they don't go and find deals. They are flooded with deals that come to them, right? So in the book I wrote, The Multifamily Investors Who Dominate, I talk about this thing called love factor, right? So the love factor is an equation. Here's the equation. The love factor is the number of deals that you were shown by a broker, by a seller, whatever, divided by the number of deals that actually closed. So for instance, if I showed you that uh, in the northern half of Florida, there were you know, 86, or let's, let's say, you, let's use round numbers, there were 100 closings of market rate deals over 100 units of a certain age. And I showed you that list and you looked at it and you were like, you only saw, you only remember seeing like 10 of those, then you have a really crappy love factor. Your love factor is 10%, meaning you only got at bat 10 times, but there were 90 other deals, right? And so it's not, it's not one thing an investor can do. 
the, the elite investors that I write about, they have like this, this sixth sense for developing a reputation over a long period of time that employs brokers to bring them deals first, usually weeks ahead of everybody else. Mm. They're, they're the masters of human motivation. They're, they're building a reputation before and after a transaction, not just during it. Okay. Yeah. The reputation is a huge thing because I mean, mo uh, commercial real estate being such a small industry, how have you leveraged a buyer's or seller's reputation uh, in order to close a deal? Um, so the, the best way a, a broker can leverage, let's say like a strong reputation buyer is, 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 is if I can provide a seller, you know, the buyer's bio, like, you know, information about them, their history, you know, they're the traits that make them good at this industry, a list of the assets they owned, you know, with 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 addresses when they acquired them. Um, and big time is is a letter of a recommendation from brokers and lenders that you've worked with. So the most elite investors I see when they turn in offers, they try to get these recommendations from the brokers and the lenders they work with. And you can and you as you can imagine, over time, you know, you turn in a letter of intent, and a half dozen letters of recommendation from both brokers and lenders, that's powerful. And, 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 um, and of course, any deals that, that brokers have done personally with buyers, that's like the best thing you can possibly do, right? Because then I can talk to sellers, hey, I transacted with dude, I, I did two deals with this guy, he was great, he didn't retrade, several things came up during the transaction, but he was awesome to work with, he didn't see the trees through the forest, he saw the forest through the trees. Um, and so, and then on the seller side, as for a seller, like being able to assure the buyer that the seller is reasonable, um, that he takes good care of the assets, that he takes first class care of it, that he actually is a seller, that he's not going to just pull back and then refi or he's just testing the market. Um, being able to say that he has empathy, like he can see both sides as things come up. Um, being able to say that the seller has impeccable records. Hey, Mr. Buyer, when we sign a contract, I'm going to give you a Dropbox full of everything you need, right? Like it's, it's all there. They have great records. And, you know, when sellers and, and buyers, frankly, are transparent, like that's big time as well. Those are those that really helped me when you have great reputations on both sides. I imagine you've had buyers and you guys have walked away from a deal because of a seller's reputation. Is that uh, a normal thing or has that happened once in a while? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not... It doesn't happen as much on the seller side. What, what happens is, is they were maybe difficult as a seller or they made it very hard for the buyer or they, they put their foot down a lot. And so even if we close on a situation like that with a difficult seller, I actually, I just had a scenario very recently where I, I took a 300 unit uh, listing to market. Um, this was, I don't know, maybe three or four months ago. And one of the top buyers that I've, I've done a lot of deals with, he's a great buyer, pays big prices, closes quickly wouldn't even look at it because five years prior, those two did a transaction together that I brokered and it was a really shitty transaction, right? It was really wow. tough. Now, listen, I still sold the deal. There's still going to be multiple offers, but wouldn't you like to, as a seller, have another mm -hmm. offer from a great buyer, yeah. right? Yeah, I know for sure. Definitely all the offers you can get. If an investor reached out to you and uh, was interested in investing in properties or buying properties that you might have, what could they do to show you that they were a, a serious investor that warranted your time? Um, yeah, good question. So, you know, reputation isn't something that just happens, you know, in an initial phone call or even the first several contacts, right? It happens after repetitive action, not words, right? So, I have plenty of investors that, that talk a good game, right? One of the things that gives brokers chills is when the guy, you know, he's introducing himself, we never retrade, we always close, we always pay cash. You know, anytime, if, if I go to contract bow, you know, it's my word is bond, I'm gonna close because it's like, the, it, it's almost like almost every time someone says that, even though you would think it's what you wanna say, it's rarely ever completely true when every single time they close, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the number one thing you can do is close on assets, but not just close, not just close, but close with an impeccable reputation, right? 
that, that earns you letters of recommendation over and over again. And so the more of those you do, the more closings that went well that you do, the more deals you see before anyone else. And on the onset, at minimum, if you can provide sort of proof of financial capabilities and experience and letters of recommendation, those are the big, those are the big ones. Okay. So that's going to be the ones where you're, once you provide that to a broker and you start building that relationship, that's when the deals are going to start flowing to you other than you going out and trying to search for them. Yeah. So it's, you know, if you haven't done a deal with a broker, it's, it's maintaining frequent contact with them, letting them know that you have the, the financial and experience capability to do it. And then when you, and still, even then lots of people have that going for them, right? It's when you do a deal that you're now on the radar of every broker right? Because every broker is tracking every closing. We look up who the buyers and sellers were. Like for instance, I track who the hottest guys are in trailing six months, right? I know some owners that own 30,000 units, but they haven't done shit in five years. So I can't waste a bunch of time on those guys because their parameters have obviously changed. I'm following the guys who are doing lots of deals right now. So when you do that first deal, that's a big deal. You do another one pretty soon. And then you do another one six months later, a year later, now, like every broker, you're on their you're on their radar list. So, are there specific underwriting guidelines that you work off, or uh, ones that you advise to buyers? Maybe a few preliminary points that need to work before going through a full underwriting process. Uh, so I'm sorry. Say it again. Like, uh, if a deal comes in, or you're looking at something, and a buyer's asking you questions um, about how to underwrite a deal. And yeah. is there s certain preliminary things that they should be looking at, number one, before going into, say, a full 12 tab underwriting? Maybe they do a 20, 30, 45 minute review of the property first. What are those things that they really should be looking at at the property level? Yeah, for me, um, I, I, I place a lot of importance on the, the National Apartment Association income and expense report, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, it's a huge package, but they actually do a summary oftentimes as well. That's only like 15, 20 pages where they do, they, they survey something like uh, 4,000 apartment complexes and they break it up by different divisions within the U.S. And you can see what the average metrics are for income, other income, taxes, insurance, utilities, repairs and maintenance, contract services, all this stuff, right? Now, most of those are for larger complexes, 150 plus units. But you can, you can make adjustments downwards for smaller deals, right? So if bigger mm -hmm. deals have amenities and common areas and all that, for instance, like right now, the overall expense per unit is between $5,500 and $6,000 a unit per year, right? Well, I know if I'm selling something that's 30 units that doesn't have an on-site office and, and administration building and, and gym and all these grounds, those are running between $3,500 and $4,500 a, a unit, right? So learning the metrics ahead of time of, of what things, of what assets run on, 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 on average. So that when you get an offering memorandum and you, you're looking at it and the broker has in, you know, $2,800 a year total when you add up all the expenses a unit, that away, that right away says, hey, there's a total disconnect here. It, it's almost going to be impossible to make this work if it was priced on something like that. Um, so to me, very quick underwriting can be done on just learning the metrics of income and expenses in the industry. Okay. Awesome. There's a lot of other stuff, right? right. Those, are, those are like high level 30,000 feet. I, I can, I can look at stuff in like 35 seconds, new offering memorandums and determine whether or not I even need to waste my time. When, uh, when, when they uh, say a seller comes to you and they're talking about pricing their property, are you giving them the, the BPO on their property and you're going through and that's what you're looking at initially and kind of telling them what, I mean, we're in a really hot market now. So normal, yeah. I mean, how does that, how does that change now versus say, a few years ago? All right. So here's the inside scoop, man. <laughs> this is how, this is how I'll, I'll tell you two or three ways of how this thing works. Right. So it's, it's very, very rare that, that the broker was ever given um, full ability to actually price this, right? What happens almost all the time, especially over 50 units, is that most investors who own assets are sophisticated. They, they, they track this stuff. They have a fairly good idea of what things are worth. Sometimes they're a little bit behind, right? Like they may think, hey, I'm, my property is worth 80,000 and you talk to a broker and they can probably get 95. But for the most part, it's pretty close, right? And so what happens is a seller will call Bo, right? And seller says, hey, my partners and I were thinking about selling. 
We'd love for you to do a BPO. Um, we think it's worth 105,000 a unit, somewhere in there, but right. And that's usually what happens. And so I'll do the underwriting and I may come up with a best case scenario of like 85 or 90, right? So Bo now has a choice. Bo can either come back to the seller and say, hey, Mr. Seller, I know you're thinking 105. You know, I, I can't even with the best pro form I can come up with get past $90,000 a unit. I'm sorry. I, I mean, unless you come down to my price, I just don't want to take a listing, right? I could do that and I'm going to lose the listing, right? Because there's plenty of other brokers who are going to tell them it's worth 105. Right. Or I could take the 105 and I can say, hey, I think we could get 105. I think it's, I think we definitely won't be leaving any money on the table. I think it's way out there. Um, I'm, that my job is to get you that. I think offers will come in between 80 and 100 or, or I'll say 90 to 100, whatever it is. And I take the listing. And, and, and oftentimes the hope of brokers is that we will let the market tell the seller what it's worth, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes sellers just have in their head, whatever the reason may be, that it's worth 105. But if I bring them 13 offers that ranged from 90 to 94 a door, that seller is going to do one of two things. He's either going to be so cocky or or just out of his mind and say to me, no, the 130,000 people you just sent this listing to and the 150 people who signed a CA and the 192 P or the 120 people of those CAs that rejected the asset. And of the, the 22 offers that you got, they're all wrong, Bo. My property is worth 105. That rarely happens ever, right? What happens is they see the, the 13 offers, the 22 offers, whatever it is, and they're like, okay, Bo, great job. You exposed it to the market. You know, this is what it's worth. Then they need to decide whether or not they're going to accept it or not. And most of the time they move forward. So very rarely, um, I, I would, you know, I would not put much blame on brokers when you see big prices. Now, a lot of when the brokers do the BOVs, if the seller didn't give them their number, and the broker comes up with the value, mm -hmm. oftentimes it's a value that's higher than the seller thinks, right? And they're super happy and they list. The thing is, is that the brokers almost always get the price, right? So one of the, one of the pet peeves of most brokers and one of the worst things you can do as a buyer is to, is to poo-poo the offering memorandum, the list price, the rental comps used, the sales comps used, because almost every time it sells. When do you see assets come on the market and they just didn't sell, right? It's, yeah. it's rare. It's a small percentage of time. The correct way to do it is, is to let the, if it's not something that works for you, is let them know, hey, great marketing package, nice looking property. You, you compliment the seller, the way they took care of it. And just let them know, hey, listen, love the asset doesn't work for my returns. Please keep me on your list. You know, I'll let you know about it quickly, right? But Anyway, my, my whole point here is that, you know, oftentimes the seller is the one dictating the price. And even if I came up with the BOV with no instruction from the seller and it was too low and the buyer says, Bo, you said it was worth 90,000 a unit. We were actually hoping you was going to be worth 100, 105. I'm still going to take the listing, right? Because I'm probably going to sell it. And the market is moving so fast and it's so hot. And the, the whole thing is sellers are always thinking you only need one person. Yeah. Right. You only need that one guy to pay that. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So when I started multifamily like 15 years ago, uh, an older seasoned investor told me the first thing to do is get like an assistant. And um, sure. what do you suggest to your clients to streamline their streamline their underwriting and investing? Is it a certain team member, or certain software? Yeah. I mean, listen, assistant, I mean, you know, anyone who is in this business that's full time, that's trading, you know, that's that's in it to win it. Mm -hmm. Yes, an assistant, but that's, but that's more for like, you know, when I think of an assistant, I think of the folks who are going to handle your administration stuff, sort of that, that lower per dollar activity mm -hmm. that, that keeps you bogged down. From a 30,000 foot view, unless you have a partner level competence, um, person working for you, that's an underwriting, that's, that's someone that even has skin in the game. The very elite investors I know, they're doing their own underwriting of a deal. Mm -hmm. This is their ass on the line. And what, what happens is larger companies have access to these non-partner, but very highly skilled acquisition folks. But those are pretty big salaries for most folks that are buying 
you know, let's just call it under 150 unit deals or under 100 unit deals. Most of the guys I see that transact tons of transactions per year, six, eight, 10. I know some guys are doing 15 transactions a year, buys and sells. Mm -hmm. They're all, they're the ones who are doing the actual underwriting and are signing off on the end, not acquisition teams, because you just can't afford, I mean, unless you're one of the big guys that have, have access to tremendous amount of money for salaries, it's tough. And, and a lot of times, a lot of these acquisition guys, especially the bigger the companies, they've got these 20 and 30 year old guys that, that aren't, that don't have their own skin in the game that are underwriting these. And there's, there's just a lot to understand and know about an asset. And unless you're the one who's doing it, it's tough. Yeah, yeah it's definitely great. Great. Uh, and by the way, most of them use Excel. Almost every yeah. elite in guy that I'm working with, they don't trust the software programs. Mm -hmm. They want Excel because you can see the inputs, right? Um, yeah. Yep. yeah no, that's, that's great. Uh, the, it's like one thing for us, like uh, when we're ready to, if we're like 90% sure to go through on an asset, we send our underwriting uh, kind of what we're thinking to a third party and it charges like 60 to $75 an hour to do an underwriting on it. But it gives yeah. you that level of certainty for someone that doesn't have skin in the game that's actually maybe has done more deals in this area or underwritten more deals in this area. Right. So it can be very expensive, like you said, to bring on someone that's actually underwriting. But I see most, yeah, most groups that are all doing it in house. It's too expensive to do it out of house. And it's also one of the things too, is that you have your own parameters of what you feel are gonna pencil for your, for your deal. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say, this is sort of related, but a little off topic is that, you know, as again, some of these larger companies, what happens is the bigger they get, they have these acquisition guys that are in charge of both underwriting and finding deals. Right. And the top thing you can do if you're large enough and you, and you, to bring on staff is, is hiring reputation first. So hiring, hiring these staff members, these acquisition guys who are also doing underwriting you're hiring the people who have good reputations themselves first, because this is oftentimes the front line to all the brokers, right? So I can name to you a lot of large companies that they've gotten large enough where now they have these three, four acquisition people, but they're difficult to deal with. They're, they have attitudes, they have big egos, or they don't return phone calls. They're not, they're not quick. The response times are not the best. Um, and so that's, that's the person I have to deal with, right? I can't deal with the principal anymore. And so what happens is after two or three times of having to deal with that, they just don't make it to the, to, to the, to the listings list anymore. Like they don't get my listings anymore because I'm not going to be able to deal with the actual principal. Now the principal could be a phenomenal person, right? Someone who I used to like doing deals with, but now they have all these frontline members. So I always encourage some of these bigger companies with the acquisition teams, high reputation first and then skills. I mean, the skills have to be a baseline. They have to know how to do all this stuff financially, but really the skill part of this, that's the, that's the big thing. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that uh, that'd be that much of an issue. I would imagine that they were, I guess it is, I guess if you're, if you're cocky, I mean, it's just, uh, you don't have to, you don't think you need to work with certain people to get deals. You can kind of do whatever you want, I guess. Cocky, cocky is part of it. I don't run into it a whole lot. It's, it's the, uh, it's never returning phone calls, mm -hmm. being slow, um, not giving feedback on what you did or didn't like about an asset, taking too long to underwrite something, taking too long to get letter of intent, taking too long to respond to red lines on a contract. Like these are, these are the frontline people I'm having to deal with. And I get it. The, some, some groups have just gotten so big that can no longer have the principal or the partners doing all the work. I'm, I'm just trying to encourage a lot of these companies to really take stock of the people they're hiring because if they've seen their deal flow go down and they can't figure out why the hell that's happening, it's little things like this where, I mean, literally for a broker, it's just a check mark. I just remove the person from any future listings because it's just too much of a pain in the butt. Yeah. And there's thousands of other investors out there with tens of millions of dollars in equity and tons of debt backing them. I don't want to have to deal with slow, slow, slow. That makes me look bad. That hurts me from getting other listings from the sellers I'm working with. Yeah. It's the same thing when we're talking, when we're dealing with passive investors too, when raising money and uh, you know, you have someone that's a pain or just like, it's not going to work out. You're like unchecked from the deal list. Yes. Because the same thing is you're working with so many different partners that you're at the end of the raise and uh, Hey, you know, what's happening with John Doe over here. Is he doing this? Is he not? Cause we have someone we're going to put in there and you know, it, it's just kind of a thing. And you're just like, uh, you can't do, go work like that when you're trying to close deals yeah. and you're on a time, especially now where we are in the market. Totally.
what mistakes do you commonly see newer experienced real estate investors make? Um, for the newer guys, I would say it's, um, it's, it's being a ghost, like not knowing how to market yourself, not knowing how to provide, be, basically being unknown to anyone with, with a track. So you, you want to have that. Um, I talk about that bio, right? So you want to have a bio put together. You want to have those. Um, you want to have, if you haven't had any transactions done, the best advice I give to these new guys is to hook up with syndicators or other bigger partners, right? So there's a lot of them out there, right? I mean, you, I mean, you guys obviously bring on investors, but you know, for someone who doesn't have experience, who doesn't have track record, who doesn't have a big balance sheet, they're never going to win deals. It's, it's too difficult because every deal has multiple offers. And I did a video on this. If you go to my YouTube channel, I did a video on, 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 on what my kind of like my secret back office looks like when I present offers to sellers, I do it in a spreadsheet format where I have the name of the buyer, the principal, the price, price of unit, price of bed, price of first square foot with all these things they offer, the due diligence period, the closing, you know, the closing period. Then I have this note section and in the notes, I'm educating my seller about the buyer. And if this person's a ghost, he can't produce any information for me, doesn't tell me what he owns, doesn't tell me whether he's financial capable to do this, doesn't tell me about the partners he's hooked up with, I'm writing that in my notes. Hey, this guy, I don't know anything about this guy, never done a deal with him, don't know if he has a financial capabilities. I don't care if he paid full price or not. That's what I have to write because I'm trying to help my seller make the most exper the, the, the best decision on what the buyer to choose is, right? And then when I actually meet with the seller, either by phone, Zoom, or in person, then I dive even deeper into the notes section and going over these folks. So that one of the best things you can do um, as a new or inexperienced investor is, is hooking up with one of these syndications or one of these gurus that, that have a following that basically when you bring them a deal, you guys can partner up together and you want to have that guy's resume along with yours when you're submitting offers and such. And that may mean you have to give up a lot of equity on several deals until you learn how this is done. And if you want to break off later on, that's fine. But if you're just a standalone guy with little experience and you're trying to compete against others that have lots of track record, it's just tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I imagine we had a, on our first deal years back uh, in syndication, you had to find a sponsor and you bring them on and doesn't do anything really, but uh, you know, you, you can use their experience for when you're going to larger deals and sign on debt and everything else that you need yeah. when moving your business forward. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business, Bo? Um, yeah, cool. So, uh, so three ways. Uh, my, my website is bobeery.com. That's B-E-A-U-B-E-E-R-Y.com. Now, even if you're not doing business in Florida, some, some, some cool stuff on there that I think if you look at this part of my website, is how is the kind of information you want to obtain and master for your market. So for instance, when you go to the resources tab at the very top, there'll be a drop down that shows all the markets that I cover. And if you click on any of those markets, you'll see a whole bunch of buttons and tabs that are like every sale in the market for the, for the last 24 months and every metric on that sale you can think of. Rents, occupancies, absorption, new construction stuff, um, market economics, demographics, all this stuff. These are all the things that I want my investors who work in my markets to know like the back of their hands, right? So the reason when a new listing comes out that there's 13 offers in five days is two things. Number one, brokers are calling them ahead of time and giving them a heads up. And number two, these investors know the market like the back of their hand. They know already what things trade for per unit, how much the renovations are going to cost, what the rents can be worth later on. They know all this stuff and all the metrics I have per market in that, in that tab tells that. Second way is I've got a YouTube channel that is that, uh, that I, I think is very resourceful, not just for young, for, for new folks, but, but even just kind of master level stuff, right? I go into how to buy more units, how to find them, how to sell for top dollar. I go over market analytics, the YouTube channel is Bo Knows Multifamily, B-E-A-U, Bo Knows Multifamily. And then I would encourage you to get my book. You know, I don't make a bunch of money on the book, but I, I basically poured every secret, my entire heart out into the book. This is everything I've ever wanted to tell every investor on how to grow a huge business. And so every, a little bit of what we talked about today, I go into extreme depth, step-by-step -step on how to build a huge business and be flooded with deals, not finding deals, 
how all the deals come to the top elite investors. Awesome. Yeah, I have to uh, say that the your YouTube video or YouTube channel is awesome. Lots of great Wait. information for new and experienced investors. And then how to deal with brokers too, which is something that I don't think most investors know about. And they should, uh, because that's where your deals come from. And uh, the other thing too is get on the mailing, get on his mailing list, because I get a lot of great information. Obviously, I'm in Florida and I invest in Florida, not really in the north part of Florida at this point. But uh, the information is fantastic that right. uh, that you provide and get on it and you uh, kind of see what's going on in different markets and uh, information you should be getting from your broker in your own home market. So thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars Incorporated exclusively.